All right. We're still in Deuteronomy. And, ha-ha. <laughs> why, why am I tempted to say this again? We're going to try to make <laughs> more progress. Um, and I think we can. And I really try to, to do this. Uh, because um, the chapters that we're going to look at for the most part, again, there's redundancy. I've talked about this before. We'll see certain things recur. And it's amazing how often, as you, you look at this book and what comes before it, you just kind of see the same thing coming up over and over again. Well, don't forget, you got to be reminded of things that are important so that you remember, right? And think about that. The reason why you need to be reminded of things over and over again is so you're being, you are reminded until you read. Remember, that's why you get reminded. And that's why God reminds his people over and over again. Now, Moses was writing this stuff down. But again, nobody had books. Nobody had their personal Bible. Think about that. How blessed are we today? The millions of Jews that, that he's talking to, all they have is a voice. How are they going to remember that? How good are you at remembering the Bible? What's in it? <laughs> and you have a Bible? Mm -hmm. How about if you didn't have this to look back at yourself and read over and over again? All you had was a voice. How many times have you maybe heard a message? You've heard a speaker, a pastor, or somebody. You've heard a great message on the radio, or you've got it on CD. And you just have to hear it again. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, what, oh, that was so good. What did they say? And you hear it again. And you maybe hear it again. Because you want to remember what they said. Uh, so that's why there's redundancy. And how did they get anything correct going word of mouth when you do it in a circle of people? Right, <laughs> right the telephone game. <laughs> it changes dramatically. Yes, yes. So it, it should come as no surprise that God repeats himself. And we're going to watch it again. And it's going to start here at the very beginning of chapter 16. It's the first 17 verses. Go ahead and scan that. God's going to talk about the feasts, how important they are, these certain feasts. The very first one we're talking about is the Passover, okay? And why does God give it again? Again, because every time the Jews heard about it, it's because they, they simply heard about it. And here's the details, So this is the reason why, and this is what it's for. Now Moses is writing down a copy, but that one parchment is the only parchment and he's going to hand that down to Joshua, and they're going to try to preserve it. And when it starts to get older, at one point, somebody's going to painstakingly copy it onto something, a new fresh piece of parchment, you know, animal skin, papyrus, whatever they were using at the time. And that's about how it went. So uh, the first 17 verses, if you look at them, of chapter 16, uh, <coughs> repeats the reasons for and the directions for the Jewish feast, the primary one, and one thing that you realize uh, near the end uh, is that it's not optional for males. So it, it's first, all you males, you show up. Now your families are invited, but if they can't make it for whatever reason, mom's hands are full, young kids, or whatever, um, you know, then, then definitely you come, but if you can't, you know, bring everybody else. But the first one was the Passover. The Passover is immediately followed by what's called the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so the two are actually seen as one. But you hear about them separate, right? Usually you'll hear about them as two different feasts, but they're all, they all take place in the same week. Because the Passover is a day, and then there's the whole week of celebration that then is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But they're synonymous with, with one another. Uh, and that's what it opens with right there at the beginning. And God reminds them, you know, you're gonna, you're doing this because you got to remember how I led your, ans your led your ancestors out of Egypt, how I protected all of them from the angel of death, and how it passed over them because of there's safety in the blood of a lamb. You all get behind that blood of a lamb. You're protected. And um, and then you know the feast of eleven bread. The idea is that you know you're getting out of there. I'm getting you out of there so fast. You don't even have time to let your bread rise, your dough rise. So don't even worry about the yeast. We're having tortillas on the go. On the go. Okay. And then there's uh, something called the Feast of Weeks. Uh, and you, you may see that. That starts in verse 9. Um, Moses says there, you shall count seven weeks. 
Okay, uh, and it's between, you know, so right, right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you got to count seven weeks, mm -hmm. and it's in honor of Moses uh, commanding to count off seven weeks from the time they began to harvest grain, March to April, and it would mean the Feast of Weeks was late May or early June by the Jewish calendar. Uh, it's also called the Feast of Harvest. That's what it was called in Exodus 23. Uh, it was also called the Day of First Fruits in Numbers. It's referring to the same thing, just all in a different name. But later was given the title Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Fifty days. Pentecost. Uh, and, and that is based on the Septuagint. Remember we talked about that translation called the Septuagint? Mm -hmm. uh, it's translation of the 50 days and, and the word that word is Pentecost. So um, you know, that feast is all about celebrating God's great generosity uh, with, with uh, crops uh, provided for his people. Um, and, you know, in the New Testament, <laughs> yeah, in the New Testament, remember, when does Jesus die? I mean, all this was to point ahead to the great, great time these feasts really should be celebrated because the Passover that they were supposed to do for a couple thousand years, who dies on Passover? Jesus. It's Jesus. That's, he dies on, on the cross. He's died. He literally is killed on Passover, murdered on Passover, because that's the Passover lamb. That's when the Passover lamb is slaughtered, that you all have safety behind the, the blood of lamb. And then, right after that, they had a festival. Did you know that? Think about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right after they crucified Jesus, all of Jerusalem, not yeah. knowing who Jesus really was, they still had a big party. Yeah. Thanking God for the Passover lamb that died for their sins. Not knowing that was actually Jesus. Yeah. And then, 50 days after that, comes the day of Pentecost. Yeah. In celebration of God's generosity. And so on that day, talk about God's generosity. God goes, here we go. I'm giving you me! Me! Oh! What greater gift! So I give you my son, he dies in your place, and now I'm putting myself in you! Oh! The Spirit of God placed in us. Now here's something really cool. So Amy and Tony and I, we did Behind the Curtain again this week. I, I don't know if you listened to it. I hope you do. Get online and listen to it. Last week we did an interview with Michael Brown. Then listen to this one we did today. But I wanted Amy to mention on the program something that uh, she, she sent to us this week. I thought, what an insight. Um, regarding, you know, you know, God in us. Now we know when the Apostle Paul, he says, you know, you are now the, the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit. Right? Because God now... His spirit abides in you. But what else was the insight about the house? If we're the temple, and we're the house of, 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 of God, of God's spirit, <coughs> want to share that insight you got from Dave Butts? Oh, sure. Well, when the people witnessed God filling the temple, when God came down, and there was a flame above the temple in the Old Testament. Right. Well, then the smoke filled the temple. Well, Pentecost did the same thing, only he filled us as the temple of God. I love that. How cool is that? Yeah. And flames were, I thought, <coughs> flames were there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Flames were there. Yeah. There's the big fire. The, the, the first time he fills the temple with himself. Mm -hmm. Oh! Now there's individual flames on all the disciples because he's filling each temple. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus said, what's the other insight? When Jesus was clear of the temple, he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Yes. What's the house now? Us. We are the house. We're the house. You shall be called the house of prayer. Mm -hmm. Think about it. No As I ceasing. never thought of it that way. That each of us Actually, as Jesus, I think, would tell us, you're a house of prayer, and you're a house of prayer, and you're a house of prayer, and you're a house of prayer, that this is the house of God. So we should be praying a lot. That's it. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you need permission, you know, 
Can I pray too much? No. 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 <laughs> Never. Okay. Uh, then the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, starting at verse 13. Uh, that was so-called, because if you remember, the Jews all, it was, I called it a big church camp out in the past. Yeah. It's like everybody had big marshmallow thingies and uh, did s'mores, and it was a big church camp out. Everybody had a little tent, literally it was a camp out. And they did that for a week. And, uh, you know, they, they built their tents at a, they, literally, it was go out there, take your sword, your machete, whatever, hack down some branches and get some greenery and, yeah. and just make yourself these shelters. You're going to live in them for a week. That's what you're going to sleep in. Um, and that was to remember uh, what? Their, their time in the in the as being nomadic. We don't have a house. But so it's kind of interesting. It's kind of, oh yeah, I remember this our ancestors did And some of these folks who were still alive, yeah, I remember this. It wasn't so fun. But okay, we'll do this to remember that God carried us through uh, some difficult times, some thin years. You know, and it's nice to know that you can, you know, leave your tent and actually go right back to, to a nice house uh, with, with everything you need. But uh, that's that. Okay, verse 18 to 20. Uh, look at this. These are uh, instruction about judicial appointments. Okay? And uh, that I want to read first. Those three verses. Somebody read 18, 19, 20, please. I will. Appoint judges and prophets and officials for your yourselves from each of your tribes and all the towns the Lord your God is giving you. They must judge the people fairly. You must never twist justice or show partiality. Never accept a bribe, for bribes blind the eyes of the wise and corrupt the decisions of the, ungod of the godly. Let true justice prevail, so you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God has given you. What's that? <coughs> What's the phrase, bri bli uh, bribes and how they blind you? Uh, there's a phrase. Bribes deceive. I couldn't remember. It was, it's it's like a it's like it's well known phrase about uh, about bribes and how they bl they blind you. you. I have right. They'll come to me. But this is where it comes from. Um, but you know, I want you to consider this. Um, judges are important. Very important. They're important back here at the beginning. Because humans are humans, and we're going to have little problems, and, and with one another, and over rights and ownership, and you hurt me, or you whatever, you owe me, and, and then everybody can, you know, blow up whatever they want their side of the story, and all of a sudden, you know, you find yourself in court, so you need an arbiter, you need a third person, you need somebody who comes in there unbiased and listens to both sides of the story, Delivers a verdict, and y'all got to live with it. Now, is justice perfect? No, not human justice. But still, um, it's needed, and clearly, um, purposeful bad judgment is not allowed. And you know, especially, you know, this, you don't do not allow judges in that accept bribes. But not funny that it was right here from the beginning. Because God knew back then, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> People are going to pay off the judge. Because he, he knows that's part of you know, many people's uh, MO too. Okay, chapter 17. It starts with sacrifices that are acceptable, ones that are forbidden, um, uh, and, and these just these things that, that uh, are part of worship. What is good, what is not good. Um, just, I'll let you scan it. Again, he talks about, I want a healthy animal. It's got to represent as best as possible something without defect, meaning without sin, so that we can agree that this thing is going to take your place. You're the defect. You're the one with the sin. The animal doesn't because it looks nice and clean and, you know, no defect. That's the idea. Um... <clears throat> There's uh, 
just a repetition about if you find somebody, a man or a woman, who's worshiping idols, look into it. If it's true, um, it's the death penalty. Yep. Yikes. Yikes. But again, God had to be very severe. At the beginning of the nation, he's very severe. Uh, for all the reasons we've, always, we've talked about already, okay, in past nights. Uh, verses 8 to 13, <laughs> church and state work together on difficult judicial decisions. That's the best way I think I could describe it. But take a look at it. Look at 8. If a judicial decision is too difficult for you to make between one kind of bloodshed and another, one kind of legal right and another, or what kind of dispute in your town, then you shall immediately go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. Remember, we talked about this before. God says, you know, at one point I'm going to... Once you get in there, in the land, I'm going to lead you to a place where I want you to build my permanent temple. Okay, And that's going to be the, that's going to be the place, the residence area of, of the priests and the Levites. Okay? So you're going to go up there and you can consult with the Levitical priests and the judge who's in office in those days, and they shall announce to you the decision of the case. No separation of church and state there. In fact, that's the wise. Well, think about that. Imagine if you, you you got a religious leader and a, and a judge working together, all the things they could take into consideration. What would be the advantage of having that? Let's just put it this way. Let's say you got to go to court with somebody. Instead of just going, I I'm at the mercy of the judge. Your own pastor is there, and your pastor is with the judge. And both of them is, have listened, listened to you and, and whoever you're in conflict with. What's the difference? Well, the pastor can speak for you and give your... Talk about what kind of person you are. And hopefully it will be a good person um, to testify for you to hopefully sway the judge's if he's going to be harsh or not. The pastor would be our defense attorney. And so Jesus is, is our defense attorney when we face God before judgment. Could be. Could be. I mean, interesting to think that you'd have a pastor or a priest and, a church. and the and judge. A, and the judge. But even if it wasn't your own pastor, just knowing that the even religious if it's your own pastor. leader yeah. mm -hmm. right. with a legal leader, that maybe there's more discernment. Mm -hmm. The pastor would be putting in things that were not just necessarily black and white. What about a prophet? Doesn't say anything about a prophet there, but that'd be good too. <laughs> you know? I mean, a prophet is someone who knows the people. And God would hopefully you know, speak through it. But, I mean, you just think of the advantage of that. I, think, no, I'm just thinking, I just want to point that out, that in your Bible, God is saying no separation of church and state when it comes to judicial matters that are very difficult. That They need more than just the judge. What's, you know, the judge, maybe you're, you're, the DA just goes, boy, I just had a hard time with this one. Let's go to church. Yeah. yeah. Let's pray about it. Let's that. pray about it. Let's come talk to God about it. Let's talk to the spiritual leader in the area about it. Doesn't that change things? Yes. It would be much yeah. harder to bribe two. It'd be harder to bribe? <laughs> yeah. You hope. You've hope. got two so. that are then hopefully working in yeah. tangent yeah. with yeah. law sure. and yes. God's law. Yes. And, and compare that yeah. to the government entities today that are forcing away the religious side of it so that yeah. they can only interject their side of it without complication, complications from his teachings and beliefs. Isn't that true? And what's so sad is that we have so many government agencies now that actually have been granted really judicial power. They, they have legislative power. Mm -hmm. And they actually make laws. And then they actually carry out sentences. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Like, like the EPA, you know, how, 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 what? like activities associations yeah, and, right. and board of regents. 
Right. So how does it work? Right. Or be on the board of agents. Right. You should put you on there. So, um, uh, verses 14 to 13, uh, 14 to 20. Um, this is very interesting. Uh, look at it. When you've come into the land that the Lord your God has given you, you've taken possession of it and settled in it. You say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Ha! God knows all things. He knows that they're going to say this one day. Verbatim. And what did they say? And when did they say it? Not very long. Remember this? <coughs> At one point they go, we want a king like all the other nations have a king. We want a, and, and, and it ends up being Saul, and right? Samuel. But this is going to be after the, this is after the era of, of the Joshua, the judges. Yeah. The judges. And we go through some, we go through some centuries and then this happens. This is prophesied several hundred years prior. God says this. Okay? And he says, <clears throat> 15, you may indeed set over you a king whom the Lord your God will choose. God does. Y'all want a king? God tells, Sam, uh, tells Samuel, Saul, the tall guy over there. That's the guy I want. They want it. Again, they're asking me to pick him out. I'm picking him out. Here he is. One of your own community. You may set him as a king over you. You're not permitted to put a foreigner over you who is not of your own community, right? Even so, he must not acquire many horses for himself. That means an army. Or return the people to Egypt uh, in order to acquire more horses, since the Lord has said to you, you must never return that way again. He must not acquire many wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. What? Solomon? Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, silver and gold he must not acquire in great quantities of himself. I want to point out that very thing. Solomon fulfills that description, as Jonathan yeah. just said. That's exactly the three things that he was known for, and God called him on. Yeah. You built yourself a big army, and it was all about how big it can get. That's the acquiring of the horses. <laughs> um, he had. 900. He, uh, you know, the, yeah, there, there are these daughters primarily of, of foreign leaders around him, right? To building alliances. Building alliance. And they all turned his heart yeah. to follow these foreign gods. I mean, he ends up building uh, altars and, and uh, temple sites to Molech. The God of the Ammonites and the Moabites and Hamash, the ones that demanded child sacrifice. My goodness. So uh, that's what happened. And gold and silver. Solomon, richest king in world history. God saw it coming. Um, Pretty much, you know, it continues, look at 18, when he has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law written for him in the presence of the Levitical priests, meaning no separation of church and state. Once again, it shows up. The, 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 the faith, the faith leader should always have a voice to those sitting in power to, to provide that compass, the moral and spiritual compass that is so needed. Uh, it shall remain with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, so that he may, may learn to fear the Lord his God. Get that? No separation of church and state. Your king needs a Bible, and he needs to read it every day. Did you get that? Is this amazing? Uh, diligently observing all the words of this law and these statutes, neither exalting himself above other members of the community. Ah. Uh, just because you got the crown doesn't mean you're any better than anybody in the community. Ah! Nor turning aside from the commandment either to the right or to the left, so that he and his descendants may reign long over his kingdom in Israel. Ah. So. Chapter 18. Uh, first eight verses, there's restrictions, privileges, uh, information about changing parishes, you might say, uh, for priests and Levites. So, you know, not every Levite was, was a priest. The Levites, remember that tribe, that one tribe, 
their job was to take care of all the things that were involved in the religious life of the nation. Uh, everywhere it was carried out, everywhere it was found. I mean, there was, it, there was a lot to do. But there were certain Levites that were, they called them the ordained uh, priests. Okay, they had more centralized duties at the temple. And uh, if you just want to look at it, there's certain things they could do, certain things they can't do. They can't own the land, but they can receive things from folks. Um, you know, they, they, they can receive food, um, uh, land, homes to live in, grass, as long as they're doing what they're doing. Um, verse 6, if a Levite leaves your town and goes, hey, you know, I, I kind of want to go over there. Oh, I want to move to that neighborhood. Well, then they move whenever they want. It's very interesting. Uh, they could do that. And, uh, you know, wherever they move, bring them in. Let them come in and, and uh, just consider, you know, your, your, uh, your, your, the spiritual health of your area, your neighborhood, your town has just got another uh, asset. Somebody else who, who can come and, and, and uh, shore up the this, this spiritual life of the community. I like it. Okay. Uh, verses 9 to 14. Something else we were talking about uh, on, the, on the show today. Um, and it, it hit me. There's a connection. We talked about it. Amy, you mentioned it today on the program. <coughs> There's a connection between idolatry <coughs> and child sacrifice. It's That's idolatry these verses. of self. It's idolatry of self, you said. Mm -hmm. I'm God, I worship myself, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, and I'm going to... Yeah, so, you know. Um, so take a look at it. No sorcery, no witchcraft, none of that, but that, that stuff's growing in our day. Uh, nobody who seeks oracles from the dead, well, psychics, that's a big deal in our day, and it's accepted. It's amazing how many people believe that. Right? How many people believe that? Yeah. A, a mass, millions of, people, of Americans believe, I can call a psychic, and I, they really know they have this power, and they can tell, oh my goodness, but they won't believe in God. Uh, they don't want to go to God for, you know, in prayer, God, what's your will? What do you need me to do? But they go to one of these people, God says, don't talk to them. You're gonna get yeah you yeah one eight hundred psychic you're gonna get the right information from the wrong source. Witches take Halloween very seriously. I want to make this clear. Witches take it very seriously. They're very active right now, and they are casting spells. It's their high holy day. This is their high holy days, mm -hmm. and they are casting spells on our president. They're casting spells. Um, on, on leadership, and they need serious business. And, and you've been, uh, did everybody knows Amy, some, some folks who are new to the church, she's the state director for the National Day of Prayer and is part of a national network of state directors. And yeah, they get information most people don't get. Thank you. It's just privileges, <laughs> you know. I've Sometimes just, it's a little scary. Yeah, I mean, can I even say it? I mean, they got news, you know, there was a hit out on the president when he was in Minnesota, you know, it's like yeah. they have this, you know, yeah. and this, Whoever knows it knows, get it to them, and they're in their networks, they're gonna get prayer because we need to pray that our president doesn't get assassinated. Can I say that's that right. on tape? Does he yeah. need to know that? And so another one in Seattle. The, um, I mean, but it's stuff like before anybody else knows about it, they know about it and get the prayer out because we need to pray we for had, the safety of our president. We had a heads yes. up on it. It came from Washington, DC. We were praying and we we were praying, but we also I found it, I found the event on YouTube live. Mm -hmm. So send it out to the other prayer coordinators uh, in uh, our region mm -hmm. and we watched it together uh, on in our own homes mm -hmm. and prayed through it. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple times That's we were right. like, oh don't say that word. Right, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Please don't say that. Yeah, but, sure. but we prayed him through it uh, and maybe. there was some of the attacks outside the yes, event yes, oh, yes. were right, that's right. really wicked. <coughs> yep. the mob was, uh, Throwing yeah. urine on people oh, oh, yeah. as they exited it. It was disgusting. But, you know, pray through that too. 
Thank you, thank you for doing that. Well, you know, it's just what you're supposed to do. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. the, uh, the intercessor. So, Is there anything I want to say about that? I think so. Uh, verses 15 to 22. Um, this is very interesting. Perhaps you've heard about this. And there's a reference to this in the New Testament. There's, and there's this understanding that um, there is going to be, that, that somehow Moses, what, what we're about to read, that this is not um, a prophecy about just any old prophet. Watch this. Uh, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like me, says Moses, from among your own people. This is in the future. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Hmm. Remember what Jesus said, Make disciples of all nations and teach them everything I have commanded. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet shall speak in my name. I myself uh, will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, the prophet shall die. As you talk about how do you discern a real prophet, a fake one from a, a real one. You may say to yourself, how can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? You know, how do we know if the prophet's been making up something? Mm. Well, if a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it's a word that the Lord has not spoken. Because anything the Lord says is going to happen is going to happen. So if a, if a prophet says, this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen, that didn't come from God. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be frightened by it. So, um, how might that point to Jesus? The, the, the beginning of that, verses, uh, you know, fifteen to uh, to nineteen. Jesus was known as the great prophet by the people of his time. How is he a prophet like Moses? Because Moses says the Lord your God is going to raise up a prophet like me. Well, God put the words in Moses' mouth, and he was going to do the same with Jesus. Even though he and Jesus were one and the same, Jesus was the bodily form of God. Okay, what else? So Moses is considered, again, Moses is considered the first and greatest prophet. He's still today considered the greatest prophet. But Moses didn't lay down his life for us like the way Jesus did. Right. But everything Moses said that God told him to say was true. And everything Jesus said always pointed back to the Old Testament. What else? Prophet like me. Well, there's nobody like God. Except for Jesus, because he's blameless. Yeah, but when Moses says, a prophet like me. Unwilling. Strong and courageous. Okay. But I mean, I'm thinking about we, a lot of prophets that came. I'm thinking of Elijah. Uh, and Elisha, I mean, phenomenal rock, rock stars in the prophet world, right? Yeah. Think of what they did, calling fire down from heaven and all that. But what, why, why is, what was Moses known for? What did Moses do? He led the 
children out of Egypt. Oh, yeah. oh he Mark. led people out of slavery. Yes. And Jesus led us out of the slavery of our sins. Okay. So miraculous signs and things accompanied Moses. Yeah. And led people out of slavery. A whole, all God's people led them out of captivity. What else? Gave them the Ten Commandments. Gave them the law. And he gave Moses them. is all about the list. It's all, it's where it all comes from. It's all in the first five books of the Bible. God gave Moses the law. Jesus. What does Jesus do as he's speaking? He gives them a new law. Jesus is a lawgiver. He's the first guy to show up and be the next. He's the, he's the only next lawgiver prophet there is. He says, well, Moses said to you, but I say to you. <laughs> what? I thought you just totally gave the, you know, the Pharisees a heart attack. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yep. Who are you? Only God can rewrite the law. Uh huh. <laughs> Only God can reinterpret the law. And over and over again, Jesus would say, Moses said, but I say. Moses said, but I say. Oh, so here is Jesus. He's a lawgiver, he's trumping Moses when he reinterprets the law correctly. Hmm? But I say, not yeah. I also say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, but I say, not I also say. Mm -hmm. ah. Okay, and and you got Moses, who can split the sea. <laughs> so people are thinking, well, he's not doing it, God's doing it. Well, Jesus in a boat, calm the he can calm the waters that are going to threaten to drown everybody in the boat. Or walk on it. And he walk or he can walk on it. <laughs> he doesn't just call it or split it. He can walk on it. We getting it? So Moses is saying, there's going to be a prophet. All, all Moses knows is that somewhere down the line, he's going to come from you. He's going to be Jewish. But he's going to be like me. Okay, because the essence of Moses is that he has a heart after God. And God even says, Moses is unlike everybody else. Because Moses, I know face to face. Yeah. Oh. Remember, he says, Israel knew God's work, but Moses knew my ways. Jesus knew God face to face before he came here. Exactly. Jesus, Jesus knows God. Knows God face to face. Has that kind of relationship. Knows the Father's ways. Not just doesn't just see what God does. He knows why he's doing it. That was Moses. He is God. Jesus is God. And he's no longer the fire that they were afraid of. He was right yes. in front of you. Yes. And grace. Yes. Moses was a friend of God. Jesus is God. Is God. And son of God. And those that knew him had that same face-to-face connection that Moses did with God. Yes. Anyway. Do you remember when Moses was on the top of Mount Sinai and he comes down and what's he looking like? He's, he's just got the sunburn going. He's, he, they had to put a, that's right, a pillowcase over his head because he's just, just reflecting the presence of God. Jesus has something, this experience on the, called the, we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Right. Where from the inside it's literally what it's describing, he like metamorphosizes. And something from inside, he just starts to <coughs> blow whatever, and he just becomes light itself. Um, the same thing happened with Jesus, or when Jesus took the disciples up. That's a, that's a matter of transfiguration. That's what I'm referring to right there. It's, it's, it's Jesus who's, who changes like that. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. So there's these similarities. Moses doesn't have all the details. He just says, down the road, look for somebody who has these kind of things. The stuff that I've experienced with God, this prophet's going to do. He didn't know the whole picture yet. He's, 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 he's scraping the surface of who that prophet would be as you're, as you're talking about it. That, that it's God disguised as one of us. And God kind of gives a wink. Yeah. He gives a little wink into the future. Yeah, he gives a wink into the future. It's just really beautiful. Um, so, it's eight. We'll stop at 18. Um, oh, yeah.
So hey, we got a few. That's amazing. Yeah, progress. We got some progress. All right. <laughs> hey, that's all right. Okay. So wow. when when you talk about.